Hey everybody, welcome to Sama, Seattle Circuit Music and Art. I'm Derek Mazzoni, your host. I hope your life is going well, and if it's not, I hope it gets better. We are here at Thing Festival in Port Townsend. Um, this is our second day, and uh, today we have Skokomish tribal leader and elder um, Delbert Miller. He did a beautiful performance that we're going to be seeing in just a little bit. We're not accountable or responsible for what happened back in the mid-1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 1900. We're not responsible for that. And, and a lot of our old people used to say the best times, those were the best times. But no, we're at a different time. And that's what they talked about. The best times in life are still to come. <clears throat> but I get a chance right now to have a conversation with Delbert about some of the things he was talking about. Um, at the performance, specifically about prophecy and specifically about the changes that are going on in the world right now and how they kind of interact with everybody. We're living in a bit of a segmented, a little bit, we're living in a very segmented society and um, we are forgetting our common humanity. As you know, if you've been watching Sama, we um, obviously um, celebrate diversity, but we're focused on championing our shared humanity. And this is one of the learnings that we've had through the work with Sama, is that you may be speaking a different language, come from a different culture, have a completely different trajectory. We're all human beings, and artists play a powerful role in reminding us that we are all part of the same group. Gilbert, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me be here. That was a beautiful performance. You connected with people in a way that um, is rare. Yes, it was an enjoyable time. <clears throat> what? Um, tell me a little bit about what uh, what life has been like during uh, the pandemic, and I want to acknowledge that that it's been a little odd, a little crazy, and I want to give people an opportunity to tell their story a little bit through that. Well, I come from Skokomish, and we I have been initiated almost forty four years since I've been initiated, and it has been every weekend people travel to the other villages nearby around, and. We all know each other. I've known many, many people, 50 years. And uh, to suddenly come to a time when we couldn't get together, even my mom was just not even a mile away. We couldn't go see her. We were afraid to, what if we bring that into her house? Yeah. And uh, so we lost, uh, like I, I mentioned at the gathering today, though, uh, we look looks like we think we can come up with some of the archaeological surveys at about 20,000 years in the same village. People have, imagine what it's like to have everybody in that same village for 20,000 years. Wow. And uh, to having them suddenly can't go visit each other. And so that's how it has been when we have, I, I didn't even know some of my cousins. I didn't know their first names. I just knew their nicknames. Mm -hmm. Didn't know them, their driver's license names. And so to know that they lost it, some people ended up being uh, orphans going through this whole thing. And mm -hmm. we couldn't go talk to them. We couldn't go see them. And uh, they didn't want anybody to come and bring anything mm -hmm. in. And we knew their parents. And, uh, and it was a very sad time. Because everybody, it's uh, one of the old things we would do is one family would kind of take ownership and say, I'll care for that family. We'll cook for them a couple of weeks. We'll cook everything because they're teaching they're not to cut anything with a knife or anything. They're, they're to, they accept people coming to support them. That's their only role, is to be supported and cared for and thought of. And they would do what we call padyalok. Padyalok is when we, you know, we always do this thing. I remember that time, remember when is what it kind of means to remember when tellings about each other's lives. We couldn't even do that. We had no, we had no way. Mm -hmm. We kind of began to figure out how to work a Zoom a little bit. My wife's a bit better up on that than I am, but I, so we, 
went to a, a quiet time. Uh, had grandchildren born during that time, and uh, couldn't go and pick them up and name them. Mm -hmm. All of the things, the little ceremonies that they do for a newborn, and sometimes they're named because of a trait they're born with, or, oh, that's the same thing as your great-great-grandfather, so that's what you're going to be named. Mm -hmm. Something, a physical trait. So we didn't get to look at them. And so birth and death, we didn't get to see anyone. And, our, and there's a great training that we do in times of grief. We couldn't even do that with each other. We had to be in silence. So that's what it has been like. And, and uh, How do you think he'll be remembered? Because there is a, we were talking about this a while ago, and you were you the analogy, like there were all these songs about Vietnam and all these other things that were going on. And um, how do you, what will you sing about this time, knowing that these transitions couldn't happen? People died, people were born, and you were not part of the conversation. Well, I'm not sure exactly how the, we we talked about we some of my cousins. We began to get together and uh, talk about it, and uh, that we should do something. And and the tribe, our Skokomish, did have an elders picnic mm -hmm. and an elk ceremony for the first time like it was like a coming out after all this time we just did it a couple of weeks ago and so at that gathering we were lining up to get something to eat at this elk ceremony and a lot of us were as we were walking we were doing padyalok remember when this happened remember that remember when and i turned and said you know that was over 50 years ago that happened and so i looked at my mom mom and this one happened 60 years ago and so we hadn't been able to talk about things, and we just laugh and laugh. And it's finally got a chance to be with each other. So we, that was our initial part, and we began to have, a, they had an evening at the, we're building a longhouse. I'm, I'm, we just got some property and are building my own longhouse, and they had an evening where they were praying for everyone. We finally get together, finally come together and pray for one another. And cry and have an evening where, and they were bringing gifts for each other. This is for your loss, and we're thinking mm -hmm. about you. That was the first time we really got to be together that way. So we we were wondering. We had been discussing how, what will come of this? What will the songs, the memory of this be? Because it was it was prophesized that this time was coming. Mm -hmm. And so we know for several years. And so some of us kind of got ready and some of us didn't. And uh, others uh, led to taking risks that, well, we got to go to town to be with everybody. And mm -hmm. So it was actually a feeling of fear, taking a risk to go to the store, something that kind of took for granted. Yeah, no, I remember seeing people yeah. afraid to go in a, in a store from the parking lot. And you would go and help to, you know, to get a list, and you would go to the store and you bring their... The groceries to them. When I was a kid, we used to watch our older people would get together and they'd have a, a lot of the older ladies had sewing clubs mm -hmm. and they would quilt. And so I watched them at the gatherings. They were together and, and telling all kinds of things, history and uh, even advice. You, and you saw if you needed advice and you were kind of acting out a little bit, they would, they would send us there and we had to sit there and listen to the old ladies talk. When, and they knew it, why they were what they were supposed to say. So they talked to each other, and we were kind of getting a third-hand lecture by them telling a story. Ah. And then my grandmother would say, "Now are you being that grow? No, no. <laughs> or are you being that, that bear? No, no. I'm, are you a beaver? No, I'm not doing that. I'll quit. I won't do it anymore." And uh, they related. Uh, that's how they would. That's how they did it. So mm -hmm. It was, was third-hand. That's so, fascinating. Yeah. So. We, we got lectured without really being lectured. Yeah, so it wasn't personal. Well, that was one of the efforts they make. They used to make it was to never shame you. Really, mm -hmm. it was the effort. The, some of those older people were beautiful. They didn't ever shame or embarrass you or belittle you. Or they, they took great efforts to, to not do that. That is so different than the society that we live in yeah. right now. Yeah. And I yeah. wanted to talk to you about that because when we came in, we were we were saying um, this is a really 
really interesting time for indigenous peoples throughout the entire world, not just the United States, where now they, there's an opportunity for a voice, there's an opportunity for language, and there's an opportunity to actually talk about the past, talk about the present, but talk about the future. And you brought that up in the context of the prophecy where, you know, when the pandemic hit, the Western society is so used to like, oh, that's just going to be better tomorrow. It's this quick fix. It's not. It's like it's still here. But when you talk about change and you talk about prophecy, it gives you a sense in my hearing is that this is a difficult time, but we need to go through this, like the analogy you made with the chrysalis. This is a difficult time that we have to go through in order to get to the next stage, yes. the next place. Can you talk about that a little bit? I can talk a little bit about, you know, in some of our ceremonies, uh, it's for one year. We don't, we don't talk publicly really very much at all. And we don't, for the first winter even, we don't get to scratch. We don't, uh, we don't eat with our food with our fingers. We don't put our, you know, in a, in a touch of mm -hmm. face or anything. And uh, so we're, a lot of it's spent in silence. And so the, it was the equivalent of the caterpillar story that I was talking about. They have a little uh, uh, cubby for them, a tent, like a cubby. They, that's where they stay, mm -hmm. the change. And it's the same thing when our children go through puberty ceremony. They're, shut, they're closed away for a period of time. Mm -hmm. The only difference the, with some of them, they they get old older people that have been through the changes, and they they're allowed to go and sit with them and talk to them about the changes and how to prepare and how to be respectful with your body and mm -hmm. uh, keep it clean and instruct you how to spiritually keep yourself clean. So we do a lot of that. And, and even you know, when you think, when you see the carvers, as an example, or a weaver, uh, the ceremonies they did for the little children when they're still small, they would uh, have uh, whatever weaving material, cedar bark or some of the grasses, and they'd put it in the child's hand. If they grabbed it, then they would slide it through, and, and, and oh, this one's probably going to be a weaver or so, or a carver, whatever you were checking on. But they didn't get to do that because, you know, they were kept away from everything. Yeah. So in, in our, the grieving that we go through, the for a couple of weeks, They'll have a ceremony to put you on the fast, and after the fast, if somebody, the family that's taking charge of them will announce they get to now begin to speak publicly. Now they could be a part of the public eye. Now they, they'll they still, for the first year, still wear dark clothing, and, uh, but no real acting out or being a public eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're still grieving, uh, and people know that so by the clothing they wear. Mm -hmm. But and so there comes a time when they do get to come out. The family that's taking care of them says, "No, you're done. Now you can come back out." How do they know when uh, it's time? Well, it's usually a season of a whole year. Okay. So we see them go through the changes that way, and they're kind of in the training of of that, preparing how to spend time alone. But it's different. You see a carver will do some of the most impactful, beautiful carving, and they're putting the medicine into their work mm -hmm. with the idea that I'm going to have this large feast in this gather gathering, and, and this is going to be given away. And uh, But since we couldn't have a gathering, the artists were, were uh, what do I do this now? I, I prepared it for this, and no, we can't. Mm -hmm. So there, even the artists were kind of uh, let down on their energy, they, and they didn't get to be as creative as they like. They're alone a lot. Yeah. But it didn't get to be handed out. The true medicine you see with, a, a, let's say, a carver, when they do this beautiful carving and that gets to the person they made it for, and the first thing is set it in front of them and they, and they turn and look, and all of a sudden it's so impactful to them. They, uh, it's so beautiful, oh, it takes okay. the breath away. And so there's the carver's medicine in that work. And the same thing with the weaving and painting. And so they... The so it opens even, up their hearts. Yeah, and it touches them, their breath that mm -hmm. way. And uh, so the artist knows their medicine was, was accepted. And so since the 
everything happened here, shut, shut everything down, they couldn't do what they were trained to do mm -hmm. for the people. And so that was taken away. So this is an interesting time, and that's a stupid metaphor, but, um, or even a term, but that medicine that these artists are making for, let's just say, Skokomish peoples, that medicine now can be brought to the entire world oh, yes. because the world now is acknowledging the knowledge and acknowledging the impact and uh, the balance that the, the indigenous people have had with their world. Mm -hmm. Like Everything you're describing right now tells me that there's a place for silence and there's a place for um, going through something and then allowing yourself to heal where it's not so fast-paced. Well, you know, in this training where there is the right kind of suffering they talk about, mm -hmm. the right kind of suffering and uh, how you respond in times of suffering. And the, the idea is that you've trained enough, with trained your own people enough, they'll know that this is suffering and so uh, they, they get to do things like, well, I'll make a sandwich for so-and-so over mm -hmm. here. It's a really hard time for me now, but I'll help them. Maybe I'll go break their leaves or maybe I'll go see if they need a mail checked in town or something. And so the, those are really interesting parts that when they're even in exhaustion, uh, they're told, no, because you're exhausted, they might get snappy, talk back, get in mm -hmm. trouble, sent to the room, and so then they sneak out the window. But uh, so that there is training in this, so where you're, that maybe if you're exhausted and you're tired, but you still go bring a bottle of water to somebody. Um, begin to have them be aware, no matter what I'm going through, with grief or sorrow, or mm -hmm. you think about somebody else while you're in this. And so uh, if they're not have, getting the training, then they're, this, the description of, of feeling anger and frustrated and don't have a voice no more, so it's easy to climb out the window and be left. And so they describe the grieving, how today's world got to where they go to the hospital, somebody's about ready to pass on, and they start to cry. Well, everybody's, well, let's have them, let them have their time alone. So everybody in the room leaves. And the time was of the most fear and sorrow and loneliness, and everything's happened, everybody left them. Yeah. And so the teaching about that is, oh no, at that time everybody's supposed to be there. Mm -hmm and support them. And that's that's what was happening in, with a lot of our families. They didn't get to support the ones that were losing people. So they were, and they were left alone. And someone's, we lost people that uh, nobody, they wouldn't let anybody go see them. Yeah. And they said, well, they're about ready to, to pass on now, but you can't go see them. That's, that was difficult. Yeah. Because so my, oftentimes they, well, maybe they, because they're that near and they're pure right then, maybe they received something to tell, or maybe they found or received the right medicine in that time of, they know their change is here, they're passing from this world and they're grieving, they are pure, and maybe that's when they get the right kind of medicine yeah. to say to so-and-so about their life, you know, and have the right words for it. They're very impactful. Well, they didn't get to do that either. Yeah. Left alone. But it feels like the processes that you're talking about allow people to feel this yeah. and kind of acknowledge it and go through it. Yes. Where we're finding right now in our society is that people haven't gone through that. They're still, they're stuck. Yeah. And often that pain becomes their identity. You're seeing people, they yeah. start the conversation with their ailments. Mm -hmm. And it, the indigenous people that I spoke to is like, it's there, but you've gone through these things to move on. And that's one of the things that I'm super curious about is like, what are those modes that allow you to, to change instead of just being stuck? Well, it, you know, here's the idea about some of this is generational. Uh, generational trauma, mm -hmm. it, even in their life, they'll hit a time of the first, first really hard trauma where that shouldn't happen, that's betrayal. They were betrayed or they were, something happened mm -hmm. to them. And so that stays with them and it becomes your identity because usually the what happens in today's world is, is be quiet. What happens in our house 
stays in the house. Mm-hmm. They don't. They don't get to talk about it. They don't get to keep it. So it's all quiet. And and so that that one initial hit what becomes what they make their decisions out of, what their behaviors are, you know. And so it begins. That will carry on, echo and echo oh. through each time in their life when they hit a maybe a a feeling. How, you can know what it feels like to be betrayed or, or, or trauma or some mm-hmm. kind of whatever it was. You know what that feeling was, even if you don't have to put a word on it, but you feel it. Next time in life they get a feeling like that, they, that's their memory of that time of that thing. And that's what I did, made my decisions based on that at that time. And so they make the same kind again. And whether it was just some, t- some just run away. Some like disappear, even though they're in the room, they'll disappear. Or they start taking drugs or drinking or something. So, and when our old people, they called us whale. Us whale chud means I'm lost now. For the teaching was that they all were born with a, a path. All that comes, that path led from their grandparents, grandparents, grandparents. They call a pata a aqua. Our grandparents, the path through all of them, and comes right to me right now and all my rest of my forward as I get that right mm-hmm. but because I I was the things that happened caused me and I made the decision to get off an old dark alley you might say off my path old dark alley when uh, before they had a sort of sense of hope and life was the things goodness of life and hope they go up to this alley and it's, of course there's dark nothing but the burn barrel and that's all they see. They look at that. They don't. There's nothing. A square lost. And so this path they were born onto continues on. And they, and and this person will feel life was going on. And so they're saying, uh, life was going on without me. And they feel it. Mm-hmm. And so they decide to get take something to make them feel that that they're longing for life. Mm-hmm. But they don't realize is the, that if they do get to make a decision to reconnect to this path. And that's what needs to be taught. So you can reconnect to this. Yeah. But that is what they're afraid of. When they, Before, when they got betrayed, they still have that same message. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's trying to say, come on, we can help you, you can come over, reconnect. But they're in the middle of this feeling, so... Even if it's 20 years later, they still make the same decision based on that time. Yeah. And say, oh, don't trust because I've been betrayed. And so they, I don't think I can trust them because I can get back on my path. Mm-hmm. So that's the effort is why at this time it's supposed to be that we learn how to love them enough that no matter what you're going through, try and pull them in. We know how to do this now. It doesn't matter if you come from the same family or even the same race. We're starting, we need to begin to learn how to love them and say, come on, we make a better choice now, we can help you. And that's why I mentioned today. I find that you can talk to somebody about that, and that can be effective, but if you, as an artist, if you're actually putting that into a performance, like you were, you were talking, but then you started doing medicine with songs, with drumming, and I find that in every culture, that affects people differently. It's not direct. And I've seen situations, we've all been at these shows where suddenly something, you don't understand the language, but you start tearing. Something happens to you. And I'm curious within the Skokomish, within your community, what role does that performance, using the drum, using song, play in helping people get there? Well, I mentioned a little while ago, they would do this lecture and say, oh, are you being the rabbit now? Are you being the crow? Are you being the bear? And we no, I'm not. And sometimes, yeah, I did. Mm-hmm. And so we, in a way, it's a third person. And the way they did the work with the story and the song is kind of goes around the defense of what happened to you those years ago. It kind of sneaks around to that, down to the, the soul, you might say. And that's... Part of the the wisdom wisdom of those older people knew that uh, I got to tell them this, and you know, I'm singing the song to it, get around their defense, and and uh, then you can even ask them third person, what do you suppose that bear was feeling like? 
what do you think it needs to mm. do now? And so then they said, well, the bear needed to, needed to do this, needed to do that. And, and so that they get to tell their own something personal, but doing it in a third person. And because of, if they've been betrayed, then they don't trust. And But this is the way you don't have to, you don't hit the same feeling. It's, it's the third place. You kind of, there's a third place that happens and you get to go around the defense. Mm -hmm. And even if you finally get them to singing, finally. When our teachings, our old people used to tell us that the Creator went to this land and created this people, gave them this language, these ceremonies, and blew the breath of in, into the land of everything, moved on, made these people, made their language, made their sound, blew the breath of life into everything for them, and on and on. And so that the breath of life was in them, and it's in us, every one of us. And and when, that, when you can see the sacred breath, if somebody said something to you and it suddenly struck you so much, it you know, took your breath away just an instant. And, or if you've ever laughed so hard, it took you funny when you finally quit laughing. So, <sighs> that's that sacred breath that we were given since the beginning of time. And we've cried so hard. I don't know if you may have cried that hard. I don't know if you ever did, but you cried cried with all the everything until you finally quit and when you finally done crying what happens in the end of it <sighs> yeah. okay the breath comes out that's the sacred breath and so if you know that you can work with the young people and try to touch that breath that maybe they'll cry when they're singing that song or that maybe they'll cry because that story made them realize something and you snuck around their defense and you got to help them do that uh, by the song and the stories and that's uh what I was equating to archetypal psychology. Uh, and I said, you guys, we've been doing that for 10,000 years, and you guys just began the last 70, but you put a fancy name on it and charged lots yeah. of money. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. We, so we didn't get nothing. Just, and they even came out and, and recorded a bunch of our old people, old stories, old history, old things. And they walked away, and our, they were going, well, that was... It was kind of nice that they wanted to hear about it, but nothing. They left without saying anything. Mm -hmm. We'll find out that that person makes the rest of their livelihood now because they sold all the information and stories yeah. and teachings from that old person. But they even gave them enough money to give them a, buy a pencil. Yeah. And that, that we find that happened quite a lot. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's a little bit side note from some of this. No, no, the, the history needs to be acknowledged because... This is a time right now where we need to hear that so we can hopefully, you know, I don't know about rectifying it because as you were saying, you know, it's the past, but what can we do from learning from that to move on to the future? Yeah, yeah, trying to touch the breath and uh, to teach how to meditate properly mm -hmm. is an important part, to listen properly. People, some people, uh, when they start, because of what's happening, they've got... Uh, they used to they used to call it it gets twisted up, and so they don't understand anymore how to listen. They get more interested in listening to somebody's demise or downfall or suffering or hardship. Yeah. They can't wait to hear what they're saying, but they're but then when they finally realize and connect to the proper training, that is not listened for. They they can acknowledge it, but what they're listening for is maybe they hear their breath come, their mm -hmm. breath touches. Or maybe you can see the cry start to happen, or you can you can even see them physically react, and you you begin to see they're being affected by the story yeah. or the song, or, and uh, that's part of the training. That's why older people are chosen to to teach the young ones. They're supposed to watch for those things. It sounds like the music, the drumming, and everything uh, gets people to be present. Like you're in that space, you're in that moment. The way you were describing listening to people's trials and tribulations, the gossip and all that, where you're you're not there. You're like, you're someplace else. And something about the power of the drum and the music and song puts you here yes. right now. Yes, and uh, in our training of this one, finally, we, if they connect to our proper training, then if we realize it, that it begins to, you know, we fix our mind, uh, how our thoughts are working in there in times of sorrow, loneliness, or when 
we realize that when we change our life, it's to, to be built up now. It's faith, it's honor, loyal, commitment, trust, mm -hmm. respect, faith, love, loyalty. Those are a foundation of who we are, and we fix them up first. And that now begins to be what leads us. And the rest is when I, I listen for the goodness of my to speak, to see the goodness, or think the goodness. And that's quite important. And but we we got to get back to where because this has been going on long enough that sometimes you miss the window of telling a child those kind of teachings, mm -hmm. kind of missing something in there. And uh, got to hope that during an initiation, they'll get to hear it then. Yeah. You started the conversation about being initiated in the Skokomish 44 years ago. What is that process? Well, Maybe I can't can speak really to talk that. about that so okay. much, but it's it's a, a life change, and it's what they they say. It's you're gonna you've died now. You've died, and now you get a chance to ask for what you really want in life. Huh. and that's quite important. That's powerful. Yeah, and the, yeah, that's the short version or description, but that's what it is. You get, get to pray for something mm -hmm. and, and realize uh, I I am in a time of change and. And they, like I was saying, they don't get to speak or scratch or even eat very much. Everything is taken away, and now they're supposed to fix themselves up. Mm -hmm. Everything fix themselves in a fast to who they are to become. Mm -hmm. And they call it being killed. And that's very significant and. That's the difference where we have to learn as a community to know how to do that. And uh, the communities we were at McCall days, and we watched them, and so many of them. Maybe we even heard some of the older men joking. They see someone they hadn't got to see for quite a while, they're old, you know, and they're, oh, you're not dead yet? <laughs> you know, and we all kind of chuckle and say, oh, yeah, laugh at that, you know, but, but that is true. And, uh, uh, we, uh, but now they get to come out of this, uh, and now they're celebrating most incredible songs and dances and beautiful times. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how this is. I, so you're hopeful? Yes, very much. We are responsible. We can be accountable, and we can be the one to affect change. And I sang this, the weaving song, maybe the fabric of all the people can come together as one now with the, and be like the trees, no judgment, no seeing everybody else as less than or seeing who I can make a victim out of, uh, take advantage of. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of what society is, a lot of struggling. You can see that where their COVID was killing, I don't even know how many people were affected. Hundreds of thousands, yeah. But these big companies looking for all the money, you find that they've been scamming and frauding the government out of $200 million, regardless of people are sick and dying. Yeah. They, they took advantage of. And that's, that's the wrong training. Those same companies should have been finding a way to help, help everybody. Mm -hmm. and that's just a victim of society in a sense. Well, it but feels like it needs to be the individual, because companies are just, you know, somebody there is just disconnected from other people. Well, they made it quite powerful, make a business. Yeah. Big big companies actually have a vote. Yeah. And how can a company have a vote? That's, how, but they, that's what they're making of into society. Well, this is the schizophrenia that continues, that you just yeah. talked about with Columbus. It just seems to be... <laughs> Going where yeah, people was was Christopher Columbus schizophrenic. It's <laughs> true. Yeah. Gilbert, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. your time. I'm Derek Mazzoni. Um, you might know me through my radio show at KXP. I've had that for 30 years right now, and it's been awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you. And um, I also want to introduce uh, a new project that I co-founded with my friend John Goodfellow. It's called Sama. Seattle Circuit Music and Art. Its intention is to bring artists from different parts of the world to the Pacific Northwest to put on concerts, not just in Seattle, but Port Townsend, um, Bainbridge, Vashon, and other places. 
We don't usually get a lot of international artists because we're a little outlet up in the Pacific Northwest. And um, I've had a great opportunity to hear phenomenal and see phenomenal artists and it's heart lifting, uh, mind opening, and, it's an and I'm trying to find ways to bring these artists here. At the same time, we're focusing on indigenous artists here, immigrant artists, we want to center these voices, bring them up, and put them on stages as much as we can, because if you fall in love with the people's music, it's difficult to dislike those people. And um, thank you. And now uh, we've had a challenging few years with the pandemic in the last administration, and often uh, immigrants, indigenous people, people of color tend to be um, uh, used as fodder in a propaganda wars. So, you know, I'm old enough to know that the pendulum swings one way and the other, and if we do more of this type of artwork and our cultural outreach, we're going to counter that propaganda that's going out. Once again, it's Sama. Thank you. And it's, uh, we've been streaming since the pandemic started, and now we put on a show um, every single week of artists from all over the world. Technology is pretty amazing. So let me give you a quick rundown of what we've been doing here. We're honored to be here as part of Think Festival. Great job with STG, great job uh, with Port Townsend, great job my friend Adam Zacks. And today we have um, a tribal storyteller from the Skokomish tribe, his name is Delbert Miller, and he is amazing. Um, you're not going to forget this moment. Uh, I want to give you a quick rundown if I can. For centuries, nine different groups of Skokomish lived in extended family communities along the beaches and mountains that edge Hood Canal. Um, this is a stretch of Puget Sound we call home between the Olympic Mountains and Kitsap Peninsula. And uh, the Skokomish were one of nine groups of the uh, Tuwaduk, who were Salish people of Puget Sound. In 1859, the Treaty of Point No Point, named after a spot on the Kitsap Peninsula, created the Skokomish Indian Reservation, 5,000 acres. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, Tuwudu groups, now called Skokomish, were forced to leave other traditional sites around Hood Canal and move to the mostly willowy, willow lowlands north of Shelton. The, this is important. The historical and blood ties to the ancient sites frayed in memory over several generations as those disintegrated the rate of substance abuse and mental illness in the tribe grew. And this is something that Delbert has been focusing on. Um, studying psychology and counseling at Evergreen in the mid-90s, Miller looked for ways to link history with healing. In one program, um, they were supposed to study Columbus and um, his thesis explored whether Christopher Columbus was schizophrenic. I totally agree with that. Um, Miller was one of three Native American artists in the state to receive a fellowship from Artist Trust, a Seattle-based foundation. They do great work. Um, and also, he also recently received a national award from the First Peoples Fund, an, org an organization promoting Native American arts, recognizing him as an exceptional Native American artist who embodies the collective spirit, that which manifests self-awareness and a sense of responsibility to sustain the cultural fabric of a community. It is a great honor, Delbert Miller of the Skokomish Tribe. Thanks for being here.
I zuf, I zuf, hartes Lobe to all the end. So bis mit Kuhm, so bis stets mit Kuhm, und die Skokomisch. My name is Delbert Miller, I'm from Skokomish. My family name is Smutkum. And I'll tell a little bit, just briefly, about that song. It's a, with that song is usually saying first thing in the morning. You see, what makes this important is that a lot of our old people used to tell us we had to take a, a jar or a glass, or a container of water, and the last thing we do at the end of the day at, and ready to go to sleep, we, we hold our hand over this and pray and pray and pray, everything to pray. So that the first thing you wake up in the morning, the very first thing you do, you wake up when you drink that water that you had taken the time to pray with. And that when this occurs, when that, that gray light first comes in the morning, that gray light, the first light that hits onto the grounds. Everybody would stop everything they're doing and, and sing that song, greeting the day, greeting a new day. And that this was the medicine, beginning of the medicine for this day. And so this is what makes this important, is to start the new day, knowing that the first thing we did was drink this water that we took time to pray. And this is a very sacred thing I'm saying here. And uh, this is something that I heard from my great-great-uncle. My great-great-uncle lived in Quillacine, Quillacine Bay. And he, was, he lived there before the time of the change to the people. And there was a prophecy about this change that happened to the people. They call it Spilach where the world would be turned from what they once knew. So this old man, he was born in a longhouse. You know, he didn't have anything that we have, shoes and all this. Didn't have that, he just had the old life, the old chaytaem, the old life of the people. And so this was a man when he got a little old enough now. You know, see his picture in the Curtis pictures, Curtis book of, uh, pictures of tribes. He's in that, and they took his picture as a Skokomish boy. He was brought down to Skokomish, uh, where he began to go through the changes that had been through. You know the, the talk about that change that happened to those old people. That old man he talked about when, as a boy, they made him cut his hair. And he, he, he took that so hard that even as he's an old man, they really don't know how old he was. He didn't, he didn't keep track of birthdays or anything. And, but even as an old man, when he would talk about that, would still feel a little bit of the, the sorrow, the grief of having his hair cut. It changed his life. His whole life changed right then. And I guess that's what I want to talk about this. None of us were born then. On, with our, my old people, your old people, nobody was born here. Nobody here was born then, unless they're like 200 years old. And so the idea about talking about this, it was a change. And our old people always had some, a very big honor for change. And that's what I want to talk about, change. Things that have happened, things that have changed. And so every one of us uh, were born in these days. We didn't have a part in what happened on either, on anyone, either, no matter what cultures they're from. We weren't there and we didn't participate in it. But what we get the opportunity to realize is that we're in a time of change. In the prophecies that I was told by my old, older people, talked about this and my grandmother said I would see this come in my lifetime and everything she told me came to pass every single one and that in this change where we are today my grandmother said we're going to have a time when our culture kind of wakes up all over the land again 
And I will do like we have always done in uh, the Khwait Am of the, the way of our old people would, would become very active. And that my uncle sang a song about this. It was a song of prophecy. But I'll sing that next. But that's the part that I want to sing, that to tell about this prophecy. My grandmother said, Is you're going to see something. It looks, it's going to be like a, a fork in the road. And she said, you can take this one road. But she said, you know what? It's going to be full of gadgets. It's going to be full of gadgets. And that we got to be careful in that place, that time of all these gadgets. Some will get lost in it. There will be some good things, but some of us, we got to be careful not to get lost in all of these, all of these gadgets. Aschwelchut means I'm lost, lost in all these gadgets. Tabarabdu, uh, they call it in our language, Tabarabdu, these gadgets. And that means uh, glitter. And she said not to look at that glitter too much. You might get lost in, if you take that path in your life. But she said on this other path, this other path is called, is, will be called Kael. It means absolute faith. This other path means absolute faith. And that's where we are. They told us to prepare, and we were. We did prepare. We did prepare for this time of this, that we had just been, we're coming out of. A lot of our families did prepare with the lots of fish, lots of the seafoods, lots of the game. Everybody was ready for it, but nobody is ready for how difficult it got. Nobody was ready for it. We had many losses. We had many losses. We weren't quite ready for that part. But here we are today. We're coming out of it in the time of change. Everybody in this whole world has been affected in this time of change. But now the part is, we're not accountable or responsible for what happened back in the mid-1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 1900. We're not responsible for that. And, and a lot of our old people used to say the best times, those were the best times. But no, we're at a different time. The best times in our life are still to come. And that's what they talked about. The best times in life are still to come. And it's our responsibility, what we do about it. And now my uncle, my late uncle, used to tell us, we've got to come to a place, a time, when every one of us become one of the standing people, the satarabiuch, the standing people. That's the trees, the forests. When you look out at the grand forest, you see all the different kinds of trees, all of them growing. Everyone has their place. But those trees, you will never ever, ever hear them casting judgment on the other. No bitterness towards the other. No belittling of the other. No, none of them standing people. They're not saying you're not as valuable as us. Every single tree in that forest has a job. And they stand together close for their roots are tied to the same place. They're all a common root, all intertwined. And that's where we are today, to realize our responsibility, is to, to realize the best time in life is to come, the future is the best time still coming for us. For we have come in a time of change in that we have our comparison to this. We were told to be ready, for it will be just like this caterpillar woman. The caterpillar woman, one day, they were told to be ready for this change coming. And these animals, they weren't quite sure what it would be. They said there was come, something coming to the land. Well, the caterpillar woman went out and on, on the grounds, found her husband on the ground, for at this time, they did not have the thing called death. And so the caterpillar woman went out and found her husband on the ground, tried to wake him up, 
wouldn't wake up. Went and got the birds, and the birds flapping his wings, tried to wake up her husband, they wouldn't wake up. Went and got the deer, and the deer was rolling, rolling, trying to wake up the husband, wouldn't wake up. And that's when she began to lose her breath. For at that time, they still had not known sorrow. They had not known death. But that was the first time they experienced this change that came upon the land. And so the kind of things that she had to do, this caterpillar woman, was directed to go into this cocoon, make a small house, and go into that house, and don't come out for a while. You go into seclusion in this little house. And so when it came time, uh, finally, they, and she was told, don't you be in the public eye. Don't you make a big... Uh, big ruckus, don't you make any kind of scene. You're to be more quiet. You're in a time of this fast now that you're going through a change. You're in a time of a fast. But finally the time arrives when our creator we call Doki Boss, our changer. Doki Boss came and said, now Caterpillar woman, come out of that little house. Come out of that little house for this time of change now is here for you. So this caterpillar woman was trying to come out of this little house now, and she was in there trying to come out, trying to come out, really wrestling to come out of this little house. But it was having a struggle because this was the time of change and it was difficult for her. And so it was said, don't you, don't you be complaining, don't you be blaming, don't you be a victim. For you, we're just asking you to come out of the house. Don't you have those kind of things? in this time of change. So this caterpillar woman was wrestling to come out and finally made it. Finally made it out of that little house and now she's outside this house and fell asleep because she was exhausted. And now finally when she began to wake up, our changer, our dokui boss, creator, said, now, caterpillar woman, show the people your new clothes. And so she's Tried to show her new clothes, couldn't try to hold them up, but it was a real struggle. And all the animals went over and they couldn't help her out. But uh, they were told, no, you back off. She's going to have to do this by herself. She's going to have to do this by herself, something inside where she has to find the way to do this now. So she tried and finally held up. And now she held up the, her new clothes to the people in this time of change, time of change. And now, after having spent her entire life walking on the ground, walking on the branches, now, after all of this change, had now come to a place where she showed her new, her new clothes. And our, our dookie boss, our changer, told her, now fly. So instantly she took up and began to fly fly, never having done this before, but she was flying, showing the people. Now, Duke Boss, our changer, ordered a feast upon the entire land for all of the people to come and told everyone, we'll all go through these changes in life. All of us are going to go through all kinds of changes, but don't get lost in the midst of our changes. Not to get lost, not to blame or be bitter. Oh, in these time of changes, now it's time to reflect. Time to be grateful. Time to be humble. Time to realize in our lesson that we come to a time of great responsibility to look at the standing trees, the, the forest. We're to make our life just like that. Stand amongst each other. No blame, no judgment, no games, no gossip, no bitterness. Come to a time when we have to stand together just like the trees in the forest because we all have a common root, common ground. And so this is the song I want to sing. And this is a song of prophecy that our late uncle used to sing to us. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh.
song are are describing to be in this very instant right now I am a part of absolutely every living thing in this whole earth I am in it right now this very second and that's what the song is talking about and to realize that we are all going through a change and this change when you start looking around how old this idea and understanding of change is. The trees, there comes a time. Beautiful trees, there comes a time when all the leaves fall. And now what is exposed is the, the trunk. You can see right to the trunk. And the tree stands there in this change. The deer, the elk, they lose their horns, go through such a big change. And that you begin to see what this really means. There comes a time in the, of the year when there's a great fast on the land and there are no more flowers for a while. And that's the time when the, recognizing the change that we're going through. And that's where we are today. We are all, this entire world is in a time of change. And that is in this change we have an opportunity to love with such passion, to love with such courage, to love one another, that we can see one another. And this song, is a, the prophecy to this song is, that was told, this prophecy, that in this time of change, that we will all come together, all come together and learn from one another, come together and look at each other in one instant, we will all wake up to something and realize our responsibility is to love so much, to love so much that we will be able to say, come on, come on over and help out. We'll help you, we'll be with you. 
Everybody comes together in that one instant, having come through such a great change in the world. And that's what this song is talking about. They told us to be ready for this because this is going to come over the entire land. We still have other prophecies that are to come, but this is our opportunity. They told us in this big change that will happen in the entire earth, this entire world, we'll have an opportunity to become one in one instant. We'll be in it in one instant and realize our responsibilities. And responsibilities are to think of one another to have courage and have trust and have honor and have respect. That's what we were told. And those are the things they told us about when we sing that kind of song. And that the song, that's why I was saying, the song was about a new day, to have a new day. And that the idea and the teachings that we give to our little, our young people, to talk about this now, it's been a difficult time. And it's a time of change. And you get to come out of this change, just like everything else in this whole world goes through a change. Nothing escapes this. Even the biggest person on this earth has to go through a change. And that this example of even the biggest person on this earth, as it goes through this fast that happens to this entire land, still, as it comes out of this change, out of this fast, the tears run down its face. And that biggest person on this earth is the mountain. There comes a time of the year the change is over, the fast is done, the tears will run down the face of this mountain, telling us, you're not too big to cry. You're not too tough, you're not too... That's all, uh, just, those are just ideas. And the one we really decide to live in full, no longer just an idea what I'm supposed to be like, I am this change. I am the responsibility, this trust and respect, this faith that I have in life. That's where we are today. And that's why I'm honored to be here, to come and be amongst everybody, getting to come out of this time now, just a little bit more. Still have to be concerned a little bit, but not as much. But we get to come out now and experience a change Oh, we come out of this change and we look around and see so many people laughing. So many people having a great time. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in years. We got to see some of our elders in Macaw. Got to sing with them and laugh and cry about, oh, all the ones that had left us. So many of us, we lost so many cousins. We didn't get to go to this service. All of the, my cousins my age and younger didn't, we didn't get to go stand by them. They didn't, they didn't get to come and lean on us for support. They had to do it on their, on their own. And so we made the, the, the comparison and the, and the teaching about the caterpillar woman. She had to do this alone. Even at the great time of sorrow, had to remember, pick up the teachings of faith, of honor, of respect. And we can still cry. But we were responsible now. We're responsible to make the great changes in this earth during this time of change. We're responsible. We get to have an opportunity to be good to each other and love one another so much that you might need a hand, might need some healing. And we come together and look at one another. How do you heal? How does your community do this? And that's what, where we are. And so that's part of where we are in our families, talking about such a thing, what we're, we're in the midst of change. And now I, I'll sing another song, that's our family songs, and I'm singing these. And this is a song, and now this may be some, might be true for some, in this kind of song, when we, we suddenly look at a lot of the men, the men are kind of getting kind of grumpy, kind of grumping. Something's not right, and they kind of growl around and kind of give a little like an old bear, you know. But the women begin to, something begins, they begin to take, something begins with the ladies, they begin to 
oh, we, maybe it's time to pray. Maybe we better start asking around what's going on. They begin to talk, and pretty soon they're finding out what is happening here. And that's this idea that this is the this is the the ladies the ladies will sing this oftentimes when there's something that seems to be in the in the works in the community we don't quite know what it is the ladies start getting together they start digging and finding out what's going on and start preparing things. Oh, hello. Oh, 
So I'll leave this one last song and we'll use it as a prayer song for each other, for every one of us and everybody we know, everybody we're thinking about. We'll have a prayer for the ones that are home that couldn't come with us. We'll have a prayer that everything at home is safe, that we're here together to hear something, to find a little bit of relief today. We'll have our prayer today that we're all kind of being woven together. And that's what this song is going to be about. This is a, a ladies' song. It's a weaving song. <laughs> that will all be woven together. We
gonna I'm gonna tell on myself just for a minute here. I retired, and uh, after I retired, I just said I'm not gonna keep a calendar. I'm not gonna keep track of what time it is. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm not going to do any of this. I'm just going to get up, and if I feel like it, I'm going to carve. If I feel like I'm going to go lay in the sun, or if I maybe I'll maybe I'll cook a steak. I'm come on. I'm retired. I don't have to do anything. I'm old now. I don't even have to listen to anybody. So uh, for a couple of days, I was watching my wife. She was putting stuff in the truck and walking around and cleaning stuff up. And I just watched and thinking, boy, she's busy. I just didn't notice how busy she was all the time, I guess. I was working and now I see she's really busy. She is, must be tired. So I sat there, got up in the morning. I, I made my coffee and got in a recliner and was having coffee and was watching his mechanic show, putting cars together and really having a nice time. I was enjoying myself. I wasn't bothering anybody. Pretty soon, she, my wife, she come walking up and looked at me and said, you better get your shoes on. No, oh, I'll come. So I walked away and came walking back, said, are you ready to go? I said, for what? What for? What are we doing? We've planned for months now. I said, for what? McCauley's. We're leaving in 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I had to get up and hurry because you stand there and made sure I got my shoes on and got ready. And I even forgot about we're taking such a long trip. I forgot. So I was trying to look for somebody to blame and she said, I'm not having it. <laughs> We've planned this thing for months now. <laughs> So she said, she said, don't you remember when I told you to get that ready? And I said, yeah, but I didn't know why. Do you remember when I told you to go buy that at the store? Yeah, but I, I just thought you wanted extra stuff. I didn't know that things actually had to be planned out. So, so that was my, my bit of, I guess I'll probably tell this, I've done, I'll probably get better at my telling of it pretty soon. How I, how I just kind of, Forgot what I was doing. Forgot to get ready. Didn't even know why we're getting ready. So I'll, I'll perfect that. Maybe next time I see you, I'll tell you, and it'll be a long, great telling. Because <laughs> I think that's how the old timers did it too. They just got better and better and better in telling things. And so I, with that, with that in mind, the last song was talking about weaving. If you can imagine seeing the weaving, all of the strands coming together. And that prayer to that was that maybe, maybe this at this time of change, that that's how we'll be. We'll all learn to weave our lives together, just like the standing people will stand together, everyone helping one another. No judgment, no difficulties, nothing and that will, all of our lives will begin to weave together like the song of prophecy, that in this one instant, we are a part of all that is right now. And we truly are, the second we realize that I am a part of everything there is right now. And so the prayer will be that I will be responsible for a better future, for a better life, better leadership, Showing our children how to love, how to care for one another, how to think about one another. And that's ours. We get to leave this world in a better place. We get to develop something better. We get to show our children how this is done. And that's leadership. One of the qualities in our life is leadership. And uh, some of us are quiet leaders. Some of us are more vocal. My wife is one that just gets everything done. I'm going to kind of figure out, and I just hang on, keep, okay, I'm with you. And then you know what I usually do? I usually end up saying, well, that was my idea in the first place. <laughs> I, I claim it. <laughs> 
So with that, I'd like to thank everyone here for allowing me to be a part of this, to see everybody, to see all the people coming together and laugh. And I'm really got high hopes that I'll go out here and find a, one of those little vendors selling hot dogs. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to ThinkFest. Thank you to Rain Shadow Recordings, Paul, John, and Mary and everybody here. Um, uh, please subscribe to our videos. Um, we love getting feedback. Let us know what you think of this, be it on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, and, uh, and Facebook. We're everywhere, and we are focused on celebrating diversity and championing our shared humanity. This is Sama, Seattle Circuit Music and Art.